Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have uh, Stefan here. And so Stefan comes to us from Leipzig and was introduced to us from our colleagues slash partners slash people we like at Wayfair. Um, and Stefan is currently working as the head of data analytics at home to go which is, which is a, um, sorry, you guys can hear the whole, the whole story as well. <laughs> no um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, which is a holiday or vacation rental uh, organization. So he's the head of data analytics there. And this week's weekly challenge was inspired or the questions were set out by him and he did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of thinking. And so I think he's here not only to explain a little bit about himself, but about um, the thinking behind what they do at home to go. And here for the next uh, 42 minutes or so to answer any and all questions. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Stefan. Okay, thanks. Thanks for, for having me. Um, so yeah, uh, basically you already got the brief introduction. Maybe I can just like add some more color on um, on basically like my, 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 my professional career and like how I started. Um, so um, I, started, uh, I studied math. Um, and usually if you study math in, in Germany, that means you actually have uh, no skill set at all. Basically, um, you can't really apply it with something practical. Um, but the good thing was that we were like closely with the computer science uh, 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 folks and I was um, able to do some lectures on um, databases and data integration. And this is something I liked a lot. Um, and after my study, I, I, I went into banking. Uh, worked as a so-called quantitative risk controller. I think nowadays I would be called a data scientist, but back in the days, this job description didn't exist. So you can see how old I am already. Um, and, and at the bank, it was actually very, very um, interesting and insightful because I was allowed to work really like end to end, meaning um, my task was to, um, to, to develop a model which was used to calculate collateral margins for trading of uh, short-term energy, so power and, and gas. Um, and here I was able to do the whole pipeline, right? Like first, like getting the raw data, uh, making all the cleaning, um, basically build a reliable pipeline, um, develop the model, implement the model, um, basically built the whole process and the whole monitoring and the whole auditing and the whole pre and post processing, which was super insightful um, because it was basically like full stack end to end. Um, and I think that that really helped me in my career that I was able to, to look basically at all the different stages. Um, at some point, if you work in banking, so first of all, I can't recommend you going into banking. Uh, banking is um, maybe nice at the start, but it's actually very, very slow. Um, and you can, uh, sometimes you want to do some new and, and fancy things, but you are simply not allowed to. Um, so, and that's why I decided, uh, okay, I'm going to leave the bank. And I started working at Wayfair at the beginning as something like a data scientist in the marketing domain. But then I quickly uh, switched to actually building up a new team, which was called data science analytics. Um, so basically we were in charge of um, helping our data scientists and um, that they are allowed to focus more on the model um, and on the model improvements. And we were driving basically insights from the models. We were um, working on the alerting and on the monitoring of um, the model integrations. So at Wayfair, it was very common, you know, like to, to just spin up a microservice running on Kubernetes. And we were basically then desi um, designing all the monitoring around that. And um, so, yeah, this is what I did for the last yeah, two and a half years before I joined home to go And then um, in January, I joined home to go as the head of data analytics uh, and uh, recently now the um, data warehouse team, um, which is mainly people having a data engineering background and having an analytical engineering background um, is now basically under my, under my agenda as well. Um, because what, what we have seen is that um, analytical engineering and, and data engineering, um, that they actually have a lot of overlap 
with the analysts basically working with the data. And so we wanted to get these, these synergies. Um, and yeah, that's mainly about me. Ah, yeah, perfect. If you have questions, exactly, put them in the chat, uh, and then I, I will, I will, I will try to um, to answer them uh, immediately. Um, I think um, if I would describe why I am so interested into, let's say, like the whole data uh, topic, which is for me data science, data engineering, analytical engineering, data analytics. So it's actually it's a, it's it's a, it's a huge. Uh, it's it's a huge area uh, where you can basically start your career. Um, so my, I think my, my my biggest interest comes out of because it's it has a lot of different interfaces. So if you wanna if you are a data analyst, right, you usually talk to business people and you talk to engineers, and you need to be able to understand and translate between these two parties. Um, data engineering is is something. I mean that's. A super fancy new thing, a uh, thing basically that um, developed over the last couple of years, mainly uh, trying to integrate best practices coming out of um, coming out of the engineering domain. So continuous delivery, continuous integration, how do I make my work reproducible? How do I make it version controlled? And to apply that on data, right? Uh, and so my biggest fun is actually that I'm I'm not a very good analyst. I'm and I'm not a very good engineer, and I'm not a very good data scientist. But let's say like I have a solid knowledge in in like all the areas, and I'm like able to communicate and to tie them together. Um, and I saw there was like the first question already. What are the biggest challenges facing in building a data warehouse? Okay. Um, if everyone is fine, uh, then we can just like start answering uh, on the questions, and I can try to put that um, then in relation to the challenge. I mean, the first question is like building a data warehouse. Uh, is first like to decide which uh, which vendor or like which 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 technique you want to use, right? I mean, at the moment, I mean, in 2012 it was easy, right? Everyone was going to Amazon Redshift because it was actually one of the main players outside on the on the cloud side. Now. You do have Redshift, you do have Snowflake, you do have BigQuery, uh, you do have um, Firebolt very recently. Um, you do have a lot of nice data uh, uh, database systems like Druid, uh, which is like um, very fast. You have something like Vertica. So I think um, first deciding for the use case and thinking about what are your requirements on a data warehouse. I think that's like the first hard question to answer. Um, a couple of points are, what is the stage of the company I'm in? Am I a startup, right? What is my expected scale of my data? Uh, am I fine with just like running daily batches? Uh, do I need to process a lot of semi-structured data? Or am I actually exclusively working with um, with tabular data, right? So for example, if you say, oh, I need to process like a lot of JSON data, then you want to have optimally a data warehouse system that will natively support that. Um, I can give an example. Snowflake is very well in doing this. Uh, in BigQuery, you are able to, to parse a lot of, let's say like semi-structured JSON data, but it's very cumbersome and your, your queries will explode. So basically all of these decisions, what data you want to process, at which stage is your company? What is your expected growth? Like these are the first questions I would try to answer when thinking about a data warehouse. And then of course, once you have that, then the typical questions arise on what is the data model I want to pick? Uh, what is the team working on the data warehouse? Is it centralized? Do I want to make it, do I want to have it run as a self-service? Stuff like that. Uh, quite a big question and I could, I guess, talk way more about it, but maybe let's just jump to the to the other questions and see uh, if we have some some uh, synergies there. Where do you think a person who's comfortable working with the current and next week challenge can work? Um, okay, so good question on the challenges, maybe for for context on them. Um, so I was so the funny situation is actually that I was just trans, 
trans uh, basically transferring the work we are currently doing uh, at home to go into challenges. Um, because like all the stuff you've seen here, these are things we are currently doing um, at home to go as well. For example, um, also like, why is this the case? Um, I mean, home to go started as a startup. Um, and now, um, I don't know if you heard since yesterday, we are, uh, we, we are now live at the um, Frankfurt Stock Exchange. So we are publicly listed and you know, at the beginning, if you are a small team, you don't need, let's say, like a lot of structures and process around because you just have like two or three people. Everyone knows what the other side is doing. You have information and knowledge flow between or like in the team and between the teams. But at some point it gets very, very hard to scale in a sense. What happens if now my team size will grow like by 100 percent or I need to onboard 10 new people? And we are currently in this situation and um, we basically had to change or make strategical decisions on how we want to change our tech stack um, in order to make it scalable, in order to not rely on head knowledge or silo knowledge and on one-to-one -one communication. So I think who is comfortable working on these challenges? Um, I think this goes more into the di direction of like really having someone like a data engineer and an analytical engineer. Of course, all the tools you want to deploy, um, this is something you could, you could explain this is like a cloud engineer or an infrastructure engineer, right? So for example, like um, you usually have a team that is managing the infrastructure for you. Like someone who's take care that your airflow environment is monitored and that is production ready. That you want to, for example, have a reporting system like a Redash and Superset. Um, and this needs to be, you know, like monitored that, that basically it's <clears throat> most of the time available. So setting up the tooling, I would say this is like really a, a hardcore data engineering task. Um, using the tools and building pipelines and working in these frameworks, this is, in my opinion, something that actually everyone who is able to code like Python or is able to do SQL, basically every data analyst uh, should be, should feel comfortable with. So at home to go, all our analysts are writing production ready SQL code. We then use in DBT, for example. Um, and this is important for me because you need to be able to speak the language of data um, and data. I mean, SQL is around in the industry for, I don't know, since 1960 something, I think when they started. And um, it's very common that everyone expect from you that you speak English. And I'm actually saying, well, for me, it's totally natural that everyone is actually supposed to speak SQL because it's the language of data and it survived already like over ages of, of time. Um, and given the scale of data and how much data we need to process, it's the most efficient way to talk to data. So all our analysts are writing SQL. We are even doing in-house SQL courses for our business members, just that they are able to answer certain questions on their own. Um, so, you should feel comfortable if you are, let's say, like more on the engineering side for like setting these tools up um, and then working with the framework you, you, you created. Um, I think this is everything from being a data scientist to a data analyst to an analytical engineer. Um, I hope this is answering the question. Okay, then the next one is what is the solid background you have that make you make you to go through uh solid background you names like you mean like in 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 hard skills um so for me rachel yeah rachel are you able to unmute and answer the give a bit more context rachel if you're if you have a good connection 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I was meaning that uh, he 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 just before told us that he he's not good that scientist. Uh, he just has a a a, a, a a certain solid background that makes him to go through. So I would like to know that that's that background. Yeah, sure. Okay. So my background is, I mean, um, so I started with um, developing websites when I was uh, 16, 17. And this was actually quite interesting because you had to do some uh, like SQL, right? Um, so, and I think like SQL is the background, like everyone needs to be able to write like really fluid uh, and, and like good and efficient SQL. Um, and then with the web development, I, I, I learned like a lot of PHP um and um, then in at the at the university i learned like coding a little bit of c um at my first work i i i coded in uh, a matlab then at wayfair i did a lot of in r um like r coding language so i think it's not necessarily about the the language itself but understanding just like the core concepts of 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 being able to to write code or to to, to script um so basically sql being having a solid background in coding um for the visualization piece i mean when you did websites right like you are kind of like trying to to have a good understanding of design and this comes in very handy so you should know definitely which chart type you should use in order to um in order to to, to present certain information in the best way um and then regarding let's say like all these alerting and monitoring this is stuff i think i just i just learned by by actually smart people around me for example you should be aware of what is good architectural design what is the difference between a layered approach and a microservice what is the difference between the uh, uh, um, basically like service architecture and microservices so i think um these type of of background uh will help you to adapt to the new situation you, you you will work in like in one company maybe it's python in the other company like i don't know it's julia or in the other company it's scala so for me it doesn't really matter what is the language itself but it's more about do you understand the concepts that you can easily switch between the single um or the different languages um how much data do you deal with? Ah, no, more and more questions are coming. How much of the data? Um, okay, yeah. How much data do we deal with? I mean, uh, we do have, I mean, there are like two types of, of how to classify that. Like first, it's just like the number of rows. I mean, you can you can envision having a, like a click stream, click stream uh, like from your website. That gets quite extensive. I think we have a, a couple of hundred billions of events um, that, of course, don't need to be processed on a day-to-day -day basis. But, but of course, um, so there's a high flow of of of, of this data. Um, I think overall in storage, we are at the moment something like 250 terabytes, um, something like that. Um, so, I mean, the the the, the challenge uh, we we designed. Um, I mean, this is basically for running locally on um, very little amount of data, right? Um, and I think it is not necessarily to, to think about scale at that moment. It's more about um, how do you orchestrate the different tools together? Like I can tell you that you will likely, in, in a production environment, you will likely never work with a data warehouse that is built on MySQL. Uh, or to some extent, not even with Postgres as well. So at some point, if you want to get scale, then you will look into um, database systems that are based on, let's say, like columnar storage, right? So like, I mean, MySQL, SQL, it's like all row-based. Uh, usually, if you, if you go to a scalable solution, then it's more uh, column-based, so like columnar uh, databases. Um, and one thing you should, of course, like always watch out for um, is the elasticity of your data warehouse. Um, and actually, the 
the systems that are currently available on the market that are really truly elastic, this is actually just Snowflake um, and Google BigQuery. So elastic in the sense of I can completely independently scale my storage and my compute. Um, so Redshift doesn't do that, for example. Um, and I would actually recommend uh, um, if you make that decision and you already know that you will have a, have a tremendous growth in your data, focus on something that is like truly elastic. Because at some point, Redshift, for example, something that what, what we encountered, at some point, they it will get harder and harder um, to keep your pipelines performant if they are not elastic. Um, so you need, you need to let me know if this is actually answering your question, or I'm just uh, I'm just uh, 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 talking around the topic. Um, yeah, I think if people if people feel it's not answered, they could just mute unmute and then uh, speak. Yeah. Exactly. Just please unmute and, and, and let me know. Otherwise, I will just continue going through the questions. Okay. What informs the transformation done on the data? Uh, good question. Um, at least if I understand it the way I, 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 I think it's right. So, I mean, there are a couple of transformations. You, you need to do and how you can classify them, right? So, I mean, like the first, you, you, you can put transformations for data quality, right? Um, so, you want to check if a value is not now, or do you want, you want to know that the value shouldn't be larger than X, or you want to know, ooh, for every value I have in that column, I actually need to have another entry in another column, basically like an integ uh, integrity constraint, right? So like these, I would say these are the transformation uh, you can apply pretty independent of the of the actual domain of your data, right? Because it's about quality, it's about cleaning the data, and this is a skill I would I would focus on of like being a data engineer. The the rest or like the other transformations, right? Like so, I don't know, building a certain metric or def defining dimensions or calculating a certain value. I mean, this is really dependent on uh, who's going to use the data. Um, and that usually will come with the requirements from the business. So for example, if the business is telling you this column is actually a revenue value, right? then the transformations you should do immediately is like, okay, uh, the revenue should never be null in the sense of like not available, or can we have negative revenue, right? Like all of these checks and transformations you should automatically build in. If there are then more fine tuned definitions of, oh, we have revenues, let's say like after a cancellation rate or before a cancellation rate, or you wanna get the revenue compared to, I don't know, the costs, for example, the marketing, then this is usually stuff you would need to ask from the business. All right, next question. Not about the challenge. Okay, so yeah, first of all, this is actually a, a super interesting topic. Uh, and I don't, I don't know where I got it, but I think there were um, some open source talks from the head of or like the chief science officer from Google about forecasting, because basically, you are right. Um, basically, Corona and the pandemic completely messed up our historical knowledge, right? Like usually what, what, what you did is you, you factor in historical data. Um, let, let's assume profit, like Facebook profit is like a very common, very common uh, uh, forecasting model. Uh, and, and they look at historical data and now you have the problem. At some point you need to forecast, uh, let's say like for the next three months, but you just have the history available that was collected by the pandemic, right? Uh, and and, and the, the simple answer is, uh, well, that's bad luck, right? Um, and then usually what, what people are trying to do is they go 
to time frames before the pandemic to try to get like seasonal patterns or, or something similar um or to they they try to robustify their input uh in terms of like getting other sources or getting certain code signals as an as an input um but i can tell you that i i, I am aware that certain ml models uh um had to be like completely readjusted because their let's say like their core um core data input was like heavily based on history and um yeah basically there's like nothing much you can do in regards to um can you build data warehouses that could help with these events so first of all i wouldn't say it's it's not a question about the data warehouse right like i mean the data warehouse is just like a very huge centralized storage of all the data that is coming in so i think the um so basically the the, the data warehouse itself is completely independent of that question it's more about like how do you treat the data and how to how you transform it before it actually enters your model right um and here i mean of course you have opportunities um for example by looking to areas or like to time frames before the pandemic i know that some people were trying basically to to estimate the impact on certain numbers from the pandemic uh, and then basically subtract it from the time series. Uh, but honestly, everything what I saw so far was actually not very convincing. Um, so I think this is actually an extreme situation we are in. Um, and uh, I wouldn't say that there's a blueprint for uh, working with these situations. Um, of course, just think about it whenever you make a model decision how much do you rely on historical data um and if you rely on historical data then i would recommend like looking into literature on topics like <clears throat> regime switching models right that you basically say okay what happens if you have an abrupt change in your observed historical behavior what would be basically like um standard uh, or let's say like uh, imputed values you could then use as a as a as a fallback for your models. Um, okay, then the next question: to ensure data quality and integrity. Um, so yeah, interestingly, uh, since yesterday um, we we started um, a blogging series about exactly these questions on Medium. Um, so if you are interested and you have a Medium account, you can start following us on the home to go engineering, I think. Um, so what, what we were doing, um, the first thing for every pipeline, for, for everything you want to do is you want to have a monitoring and that monitoring needs to be automated. Like you run something in Airflow, your pipeline is breaking. You don't want to send an email to one single person. You want to send that to a centralized Slack channels with all the alerts coming in, right? So this is like the first thing. You need to be first, you need to be aware that there is a problem, right? And this is only something you get via monitoring. And it's actually super handy. You just, you know, like in Airflow, you can make a basically make a make a make a make an unsuccess or on failure task. Uh, and then I think writing a Slack integration, I think it's like 30 lines of code and then you will always get informed. Um, so first, be aware of the problem. Um, second, what we uh, then do is we are using DBT expectations. So our, all our pipelines basically on the transformation side are running in DBT. DBT is an, an additional module called DBT expectations, which makes it very, very easy to write I would say like accuracy tests, like not null in a certain range, uh, integrity tests, like this dimension can only be of the subset of something else. And, and for this, we use DBT expectations. Um, and this is actually working pretty well. We then even design our pipelines that if one of our tests is failing, we won't update the production data and we will get an alert into our channels. Um, and then the even more fancier thing is now that if you look at data pipelines, it's sometimes your pipeline can run through, 
but the data the data that got created is actually completely rubbish right and so you just you, you're not allowed to only rely if the pipeline was successful or not you need to have some dynamic data testing uh, this is i think how it's called uh, if you want first if you want to read about that topic um you can um you, you should follow um the ceo of monte carlo uh, uh, her name is bar moses so basically she is writing a lot of content um on all that data observability uh, is how she's calling it and she's defining certain metrics you want to look at so you want to know is my data fresh in a sense of when was my last update what is my usual update cycle do i see an anti pattern here is my volume like still correct yesterday i got one million rows today i could just get 10 i want to want to be notified um do i see missing data um because sometimes you see that some data for certain dimensions is missing this is something you want to know um so like freshness volume missing data um these are things you you want to capture as well um and we are using a tool called anomalo um so they are like it's a young startup um because they they allow us to monitor a table they give us all this volume and recency and like all of that stuff out of the box so without any configuration work um and they have on top um they basically are monitoring distributions over multiple columns so they do have facebook profit internally they even have an ml based anomaly detection component um which makes it like super handy whenever they notice something where the distribution is changing unexpectedly we get a slack alert right and then our uh, our data teams can basically investigate on that um I think I hope this was answering the question. So basically, TBT expectations for the really raw and basic stuff, and then some more advanced dynamic data testing um, using different tools. I mean, you could go with great expectations as well. And the big advantage of Anomalo is that it was like super easy to integrate. Like you just set it up, you just say this is a table you should monitor, and then all the integrations on Slack and everything else, like super simple. Um, what is the ideal junior data engineer you could think of mentoring? Oh, uh, that's a good one. Um, of course, I mean, so even if it's if it's a junior one, I think there's the there are like two components. First, the first component is you need to have a certain toolkit, right? And I, for me, the tool, toolkit for this for for starters is SQL and Python, or like programming, right? Like any any language, like these two things. If you would need to start mentoring this, right, it will just like delay you for a lot. Um, the rest, everything else, I think is is based on being motivated and be mutually interested in the topics, right? I think we are living in a in a world where so much information and learning opportunities is available just by one click, right? So if, if, if I would like now to go and learn about what are the different types of APIs, right? I can find like 50 articles and, 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 and find books about it and can like immediately jump into the topic. What, what I need for that is I need to be interested and I need to be motivated and I need to accept and to understand that learning will be a very important component of not only my education, but of my day-to-day -day work. So if I would have someone who basically have the basic skills and is motivated to learn on a constant basis, I think this is the best combination you can, you can look for. And this is a general advice, like this whole data topic. I mean, um, if you think about the changes that happen to the data ecosystem, in the last 10 years there's like still so much development pay uh, a speed and there's like still so much stuff where we are still not good at that our landscape will change significantly over the next 10 years and if you stop learning then at some point 
you won't be able to cope with all the changes anymore. Um, and that's why I would say accepting that learning and relearning and learning new things is a, is a main ingredient of, 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 your, of your work. I think this will help a lot. Okay, Itan Junior, how is your work environment for a junior data engineer joining the company? Um, okay, that's a good question. So, so maybe I, I, I won't basically just put it on the on the data engineering, but on our data teams as general. Um, so our setup is we have a decentralized setup, meaning the um, data engineers are supposed to work very closely with the engineering teams. Our data analysts are working very closely with the business teams. Um, and and um, I can actually, I, I can just make some, some, some commercials. So if you are interested in uh, like how to set up certain teams and how can teams can interact. So this is a book I like very much, very recent. Um, and, and so basically our idea behind that is that we want to um, we want to set up our teams for a fast flow, fast flow of information, of communication, that teams are independent and can basically like drive their own agenda very fast. Um, if you would join our company um, at the beginning, you will likely then work or like have a dedicated business domain you would work for. Um, and what we then do is we have a something called like a data competency center or community of practice or center of excellence, however you want to call it. And we are responsible for onboarding the data team member, giving basically uh, providing them with all the access they need, um, with all the tooling, what we have, with all the training materials. Um, and then basically making sure that they are set up and they understand how our processes and our toolkit is, uh, looks like. And then, of course, we have the business onboarding. Um, so basically, then the business stakeholders uh, will start providing the what. What is uh, uh, what is basically the topic you're supposed to work on? What is the priority? And we, as a data competency center, we then provide guidance on how you should accomplish that task. Right. So uh, basically, it's a it's a, it's a it's a it's a matrix approach. We have one line to the business giving you the priorities and the goals and then we are providing the mentoring and the and the how um for the junior for the junior other team members um all right how do you decide when to use etl elt and el extract and load and no transform okay uh, can you give a scenario for each use case? Uh, to be honest, I mean, we are mostly doing uh, ELT um, simply because like storage gotten so cheap um, uh, recently that you will be way more flexible by following the ELT approach um, rather than like already uh, kind of like transforming the data before you load it. Um, if you have basically like you are not working not on a on a cloud data warehouse and you actually have already certain performance constraints from the database tooling you are using then i would say um etl would be appropriate right so basically you extract it then you already make your aggregations and then you just load the final aggregations into your into your data warehouse um, if possible, I would always go with ELT. Um, but this, of course, depends on the amount of data you need to process um, and uh, yeah, on the technology you are using. For basically storage of raw data, um, there's like a lot of interesting uh, uh, technologies out there. So for example, what we are using is um, um, Delta Lake, uh, basically from, from, from Databricks which will allow you to store a huge amount of raw data using the Pucky file format. Um, and this is something that you could think about if you design your data pipelines and you want to have a staging area, like a staging layer before your data warehouse, then I would definitely recommend you uh, looking into 
solutions that allow basically like versioning of your raw data to some extent. So that would be then the extract and and load. But I mean, this is really depending on the use case, um, how to set up these structures. If you want to want to work in a data warehouse environment, or if you rather want to work in a in a data lake environment, let's say like this. Um, is DBT expectation similar to Python support in Postgres SQL? Um, so there is an open source framework called Great Expectations, and Great Expectations provides you the ability to write data quality tests for Python, even for Spark, um, and of course, like for some SQL data. Um, and DBT expectation is basically focusing on data quality for SQL pipelines. Um, exactly. Yes? No, I think I'm not sure it was just a random noise. Does anyone want to say something? So, so the DBT expectation for me was just much more of curious curiosity because Postgres also has some support. You can write some Python uh, oh, yeah, codes. You, you mean you mean uh, so-called UDF functions, right? Like, yes, and then which you can use them to to check some constraint. Is that something similar? Well, I mean, in spirit, of course, in, in terms of degree of freedom, might not be the same. It is, it is similar, and it's actually a very nice point that you're raising it. Um, so it's similar, but it's actually way superior. So why? Um, if you if you design if you design all your data qualities, for example, in a tool like DBT expectations, you are able to reuse it, right? Like you can then use it in Spark, or you can use it in Python uh, Pandas data frames, or you can even use it in SQL pipelines. Um, for example, implementing data quality checks in Postgres UDFs, that might work fine for the beginning, but just think about you need to migrate them from Postgres to somewhere else. Um, and let's assume your new data warehouse is not supporting uh, Python UDFs. Um, for example, Google BigQuery, as far as I remember, um, when, when, I, when I worked with it, they were allowing writing SQL UDFs and JavaScript UDFs, but no Python UDFs. Um, so for example, here, deciding for implementing something very specific to the database system you're choosing will and could at some point result in a so-called vendor login and you would need to touch all the UDFs and migrate them, which of course will be like a lot of work. If you do it in DBT expectation and it's modular from basically like your environment where you're processing your data, you can very easily switch from Spark to Pys uh, like to, to, to Pandas data frames and can just migrate it automatically. Um, so if you would ask me if I would do Python and Postgres SQL, I would say no. <laughs> Uh, and I would, no, just just want to great thanks. It's it's actually a very nice reference to the second challenge about change management, right? Um, and about um, so when we or oh, what you should keep in mind when you are setting up your your tech stack, um, I think, and this is a great the great development over the recent years. Our tech stack can be designed very modular and it's not that like like ages ago you went to tableau and tableau was basically trying to sell you all the functionality under one roof the the new designs are actually way more api based and you will select the one tool that does that one job the best the the big advantage of this is that it will keep you away from vendor lock-in and it will allow you to change your environment not by changing all the pieces but just like changing single ones one example and, and this is um this is a direct from 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 our situation home to go um we want to we want to migrate from redshift to snowflake for example um 
and we have all our transformations in dbt um, and the good thing about that is we can programmatically and automated migrate all our scripts from redshift to to snowflake by just writing code so our pipeline will be like oh this is my dbt model uh take it um run it through an basically like a syntax parser from redshift sql to snowflake sql then run the model on 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 snowflake itself run like all the tests um and you can basically like just define that all in one python script so migrating all our models which can be like a couple of thousand tables will just take one or two or three days instead of basically touching all the scripts manually being executed by r or by python in jenkins or whatever um having modular solutions will help you to change your environment faster um and that's why i'm a i'm a super big fan of 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 keeping things as modular as possible uh, and and picking the right tool for the job basically um aws gcp is important to have especially for a junior data engineer no um why i mean um you need like you are just gaining knowledge and experience when you work with these tools uh if you make a i mean of course it's recommended if 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 you want to know what is basically aws versus um gcp what do they offer as a service there are a couple of articles around to say oh they have um i don't know um in aws for example it's called a uh, ek uh, e k r for example to running kubernetes on 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 amazon infrastructure i think at google it's called no i'm actually embarrassed because i should know that i hope brenda is not in the call um but i think they have a different name for it um for running for running kubernetes than on on on, on gcp you will learn the differences and the advantages just by working with it um and you can actually be sure that most of the functionality from from gcp and aws they likely always have some service that will allow you to do the same thing as on the other side um so to answer the question no not for a junior one um because you just gain the experience by really working uh working on these infrastructure and on these platforms fantastic i mean this is really wonderful i think uh, we had a number of very interesting questions and i think this is really um even for me it's just like i learned so much in terms of also the different experiences that you have so i'm i'm assuming that everyone here also learned from the questions and the practicality actually what is really missing i would say in any of the training whatever training you do is just the, the complexities that comes uh when you try to do them in real sensitive uh, cases right like that the business depends on them and you have to learn um you have to be careful you have to do the alert you have to and it's lots of people uh the entry cases in that so i think that I'm, I'm really happy that you you are kind of like open to speaking in some of them in much more detail. So really, thank you so much. So yeah. if anyone here wants to unmute and say a lot of thanks, and if you are also interested, when once they finish, we would like to select a few, and then that you could look and, and give some comment uh, for this week as well as also next week. Just we know that you don't have time. Your your well, no, things I, would be great. I don't have a follow-up appointment. I've seen there's actually it was a was a new question coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from scaling, what other cases or scenarios can warrant the migration of a tech stack? Uh, quite a lot. Um, but of course, you're right. Like that, that scaling is a is an important uh, important driver of that. Um, I can give you an example. Um, 
for example, if you use open source and you see that that the product is not actively maintained anymore, uh, something what you can, for example, now see with Redash. Uh, Redash was very famous and then it got acquired or kind of like put under the roof of Databricks. And since then there was like no update uh, on, on the product itself. And, and so it would handle the scale, but it's actually not developed further. So that's why you want to change it. Or um, there is a new vendor providing way more functionality. Um, so we are we are currently looking to find something to replace Tableau. Uh, I, I really don't like Tableau uh, simply because it 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 uh, includes business logic really in the reporting tool with no way of exporting it. So. Um, now I am I am asked. I need to find a reporting solution that will allow us to to get business logic and something I can programmatically work with, um, and at the same time that is having a UI and an interface that uh, business users feel comfortable with. Um, so Tableau, to some extent, might be able to handle the scale. Um, but it actually provides us a lot of vendor lock-in. That's why we want to change, right? Great. Yeah, so I, I will just close it because there will be also another call in um, another session in five minutes. But I would still uh, like to just say, if you could, if you just to say like, if we could send you a few of the, um, the works that the people have done here uh, on those projects so that it can give us more kind of in which direction should people improve uh, for example uh, from practical perspective you know it's like if it were implemented in your case for your company you would have given that comment so if you would be uh, interested or if you, if you would have some time to do that that would be great okay sure yeah wonderful and so and then i would ask um, one or two people to just say thank you, if you can oh, raise all good. your hand or unmute. All, all good. Like we have five minutes. If you have other questions, you you, you yes. can, like ask me anything. Uh, I'm I'm happy to answer everything. Arun, maybe. Are you there? If you're there. Um, Nathanael, Nathanael, yeah. Okay, thank Please. you. Uh, so I really enjoyed uh, this interview and uh, watching an actual uh, person working on the tools that we are currently working on uh, is a very interesting. And the one thing uh, I really liked is how you treat the junior developers and your expectations were like very low, I guess. Knowing only Python and SQL could be sufficient for a junior developer is an interesting thing for me since mm -hmm. we are working on many technologies so i'm hopeful we, we could we may be joining your company after we finish this training okay, thank you okay oh my link my linkedin uh yeah uh i can send you my linkedin give me a second So this is my LinkedIn. To say again, Stephen helped us to design both the current and the next week um, challenge. So as he said, it is inspired by the things they do there. So I think, and also you you heard the confirmation, you know, what is needed and the kind of complexities. And most of it is already in the, in the challenge. So put uh, as much effort as you can. Great, and thank you so much, Stefan, for You're welcome. All that. Yeah, okay. uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.